Well, let's pray together. Let's ask the Lord to bless our worship service this morning. Let there be a wonderful sense of joy as we sing to the Lord and praise him. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the joy that is in our hearts, the joy of worship, the joy of fellowship, and most of all, the joy that we can call you our God and we your people. May we enter into your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts for your blessings. And as we think of the year ahead, the 23rd year of ministry, we ask for faith once again to do the work you've called us to do, to be the church where Christ is head. And we ask that you would bless our worship offered to you this morning too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first hymn that we're going to sing together is a wonderful hymn that sings about the gospel being shared. 229, is it in your hymnal? You're using your hymnal. If not, it's, it's going to be projected. And worship can be a most uplifting experience when we have the right inspiration. I like Psalm 9, verse 1, where it says, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. How can we praise God with our whole heart? It is hard when we don't have the, the right inspiration. But when we do, it is not that hard. And the hymns are beautiful because it provides that inspiration. And so some of the hymns this morning we will be singing, may it inspire us to worship the Lord. 229 sings of the gospel. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Good news announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness. And then it sings, our God reigns. Paul wrote about how vital it is that the gospel is to be preached. In Romans 10, and he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Genuine faith. How does faith come? How do we find this genuine faith? It comes by the preaching of the word of God, the preaching of the gospel. That's how I found genuine faith. Bethany, you sent your best. A preacher came and he shared the gospel in a way and I listened. And at 18 years old, I was lost in darkness. I found genuine faith through your preaching of the gospel. And anyone and everyone who has genuine faith believes in the preaching of the gospel. It's so precious. It's so beautiful. In our anniversary dinner, you know our poultry cards? We were giving them out. It, it saddened us that some left the poultry cards behind. But it delighted me when John and Bev from Manor Inc. And they said, can we have some more? Because we would like to give this to the homeless. We, we provide meals for them. But we would also like to share with them this faith. And I was just so happy to give whatever is left to, to them. And that's what genuine faith does. This is a wonderful song. We sing of the Lord Jesus who came, who preached the gospel of the kingdom, that our God reigns. Let's sing this together. Let this be a wonderful first hymn. How lovely on the mountain are the feet of him who brings the gospel. Let us be the messengers of the Lord to proclaim the gospel of Christ in our new year ahead too. Well, let's sing this as our first hymn together. <clears throat> it is wonderful to have genuine faith. And you know that you have genuine faith when it is there not only the next day, but year after year for almost the next, for myself, 19 years. But it's not just genuine faith. But what is needed is a growing faith. 
How does faith grow? And sometimes, and what is needed, very often, faith grows when that faith is tested. That's also how we know when this faith is real. Under testing, we will see whether this faith is true or not. But under testing, this faith can grow. We have a beautiful hymn that is to be sung next, 496 in a hymnal, He Hideth My Soul. Sings of how our faith can be drawn closer to God through testing. Testing will come. We don't ask for it. I don't ask for it. I, I certainly don't pray, Lord, test me. I don't. I really don't. But when you go through testing, you ask, Lord, would you be there for me? He hideth my soul is a beautiful hymn. A wonderful, Je- a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. Another beautiful way of describing that protection where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that, dry, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. We don't know what this year will unfold for us. There could be testing for, for, for you. Already, some of our brethren are already going through testing. Our brethren in Singapore, our brethren here in Perth. Let's let this faith be even stronger. Let's draw close to God. Let this hymn help us to draw close to God. Let's sing this together. He hideth my soul. Thank you for singing that song the way you just did. You know what we appreciate about our faith in God? What I appreciate about my faith in God is the relationship we have with Him. That I can relate with God on a deep and personal level. My Savior's love, where once I could not relate with God, this heart was so hard and it could not feel love. The way faith came in, it enabled, it opened up to the love of God. And that love is just treasured, and we ought to treasure it. The danger is we don't treasure when love is poured into your heart. I remember over 12 years ago, that would be, I was, I was in Singapore training as a student pastor. I was so moved. And one evening service that they had there at they have a lunch program as well. Not only that they have breakfast and lunch, they also have dinner in Bethany. And so after the worship, they had a dinner, and Auntie Sally brought out a cake. And she said, happy birthday, Chris. I never forgot that, Auntie. She baked me a chocolate cake. And every year she would text And on my birthday, to do this day, she has such a fantastic memory. She would wish me happy birthday. She would wish me happy anniversary for my wedding. And I just feel so bad when I forget her birthday. (laughs) It comes one week later. (laughs) I just, (laughs) but I just so deeply touch that love continues to be just swells up. And she's here and with all the different, I could mention so many. The people who came from Singapore, they're not just guests to me. They are people who have loved me much. And when their sons come, that same love I determined with my heart to be shown to them. My Savior's love. This is what I treasure about my faith. His love for me. Where I was so wretched and sinful. He bore my sin, he bore my sorrow, and he made them his. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. Well, let's sing this together. Let's rise as we sing of our Savior's love. It's my great joy and privilege 
to hand this time over to Pastor Charlie. One of the greatest joys that we must have in our hearts is that God has given to us his word and our response should be that of hiding it in our hearts because we want to. I think this is something that we often take for granted. We don't. We get Sunday school students to memorize the Lord's word, uh, but we don't do that as much as we should. And I think this is something that we want to be able uh, to do. Psalm 17 and verse 8 is a Bible memory verse, and I want to encourage you to hide this in your heart. And that is, it's just such a joy to be able to do that. Not hard at all, two parts to it. Uh, very similar idea, but it's just wonderful to know the Lord uh, watches over us and keeps us. Okay, let's try this. Psalm 17 and verse 8, keep me as the apple of your eye. Let's try this together, everybody. Here we go. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. And it is really a prayer uh, for protection. And how would the Lord protect us? We're asking, Lord, you know, as much as the apple, one night we call it the eye, and then, um, you know, it's just automatically, naturally, we protect the eye. And that's how the Lord will respond to us naturally. And then hide me under the shadow of your wings. And this is something that we want to pray for. You know, as we live in a very, very troubled world, um, it is something that we want to pray about. The Lord will watch over us as we travel, as we move from one place to another, or as we face challenges and problems in life. We, you know, can try and see whether we can uh, make this our prayer. Let's once again, Psalm 17 in verse 8. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. And may this be something that we find to be very real and true and precious. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that you would bless us as we begin our 23rd year. We give thanks for a wonderful year of ministry. We give thanks for the 22 years of mercy and the way you watch over us, hiding under your wings, keeping us as the apple of your eye. Help us to respond effectively, meaningfully. We pray for your blessings as we read your word, as we begin the 23rd year. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, our commencement of the 23rd anniversary begins with the reading of a wonderful text um, in the Scriptures. And I would like you to, if you could, turn to the book of Hebrews 12, just the first two verses. <clears throat> they are really, really meaningful uh, verses, and I want to share them with you. <clears throat> okay, well, let's read this uh, so that we can get a feel of it. Always get a feel of the Lord's word, and then before we catch, to try to attempt to look at the meaning. Okay, here we go. Therefore, together, therefore, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has at last sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's easy reading. Now, question is, what is the meaning of it all? And there are two main thoughts that I want to bring uh, to your attention this morning. Okay? And the word, the first thought is, is simply the first word, therefore. 
Whenever we see the word therefore, we always ask ourselves, what is it there for? Now, it's easy enough to raise that question. You see, there are a number of ways in which you can write the word therefore. In English, there's only one way. <coughs> or in Greek, is uh, you can use several ways. You can simply say, uh, therefore, un. You can say, for this reason, therefore, dia uh, tuto. Or you can say it in different ways. This is a very unusual therefore. A very, very unusual therefore because it is actually a combination of three thoughts. And he pulled them all together into one. Right? I mean, for example, you see something, you don't know what it is. You, what is this? You don't know what it is. So in English, what we call it? What you may call it? Right? You, you know the phrase called, what the word called, what you may call it? What you may call it is made of watch what you call it. You know, basically it's one. It's actually by itself, it tells you nothing. But combined together, you pay attention what you may call it. This is one of those words. Therefore, is a combination of one, two, three words combined. By itself, it can mean different things. Put it together, it tells us something. Usually the word therefore is motivation, right? Because of this, therefore, do something, be motivated. When you have a combination, one, two, three things together, literally means for, therefore, thus. That doesn't make much in, make, make sense. It doesn't make sense in English, and so it doesn't make much sense in Greek. But when you put them together, it is to tell you, there is deep motivation going on here. And we all need a reason. We all need motivation, deep motivation to do what we want to do. If a person is unwell, what is the motivation? Get well. Right now, even as I speak to you, one of our church members uh, took ill very, very suddenly and seriously. And uh, he had what is known as an aortic dissection. What it really means is that the main aorta has burst, this tear there. And, you know, for three hours, the doctors were trying to staunch the blood flow. And we don't know what is the extent of the damage yet. They're going to sedate him for two days, and we're going to watch and see what happens. And lots of problems can come out. What is it that will move you? This. You see, we call it deep motivation. I spoke to his dear wife, and she was weeping on the phone. Well, we can understand that. And she keeps in touch with everybody, you know, those of us who are praying alongside, and we're just praying. What is it? It's something that moves us. We call this deep motivation. And all parents know it. Our biggest, deepest motivation are children. And grandparents do it twice as well. Because now grandchildren, children together. You never stop worrying about children, no matter how old they are. And then you add grandchildren, you add another layer. But there we go. And this is such a wonderful thing. Motivation. We all understand deep motivation. What's deep motivation? I think it is so wonderful. I, I met a lady uh, at, at the anniversary dinner, and uh, Madam Lim, is she here today? Okay, there we go. And, and she said to me, you know, I must try and bear witness for the Lord. But so, so can sing. And it's so wonderful to hear her speak like that. I must praise the Lord. I must do this. And her motivation is, she, he has saved me. He has made me well. And, you know, he has been good to me. I cannot but be deeply motivated. This is the word, therefore. It tells you deep motivation. 22 years, you know, I would drive the pastoral team from Singapore. And they said, this is where we began. See? Small little house here. And we were there the main street years. Then we came over here. 
together you add them up. There is deep motivation to do something. Several years ago, there was a time of deep healing, repair. And then we look at the present state of growing. We just wonder, one day, will we be able to fill the pews? We used to have only two rows. We ask people all sit in the center, so don't, don't look at the side. And then we're going to go into this now. Well, I think that is deep motivation. Do something. Build something. You see, this is what we mean. If we have this faith, if this faith is real, we've seen it real, we'll see how it works when we apply that faith, then we can say, therefore, let's do this. Let's do this. Can, can you see this? We all need a motivation. How do we begin the 23rd year? Motivation. I was so happy when I saw Bobby here. I said, hey, Bobby is in Perth. When the singer got married in Singapore, and then uh, married in Singapore, not to Singapore, I mean. And, and there we go. And uh, this time, say, hey, what's Bobby doing here? Well, I came with mom. It's hello to see, hello to see auntie here. And it's just good to see, you know, this thing. Yeah, there is a joy that being part of, that motivation is there. And this is what we want to see. You know, if we have a faith that moves us, if we have a faith that deeply motivates us, if we have a faith that drives us, I think that's really, really, really wonderful. And I wish that we will have this motivation as we commence our 23rd year. What's our motivation? Let's do something about it. Let's be moved. Let's be motivated. Let's let this faith move our hearts to do something great for the Lord in the year ahead. That part is easy. Now, that's the first thing. The second part is a little harder. Okay, I'm going to share with you something that you will not see in the English text. Take, for example, we see this text here, and we read. Okay, now, let me just, we read. Therefore, uh, since we are surrounded, right? In English, technically, this is a verbal idea. We are surrounded. Can you see this? Because we subject here was surrounded. All right. Now we go on further to talk about. Let us lay aside another subject. Right? Another main verb. Another main sentence. Right? In English, that's how it sounds, isn't it? Can, can you see this? Let's brush a, brush up a little bit of English a little bit. I'm not even sure that we all uh, we, we understand. Uh, you know, we have properly. Uh, we properly learned this. Can you see this? Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it looks like a sentence by itself, doesn't it? We are surrounded, correct? Uh, let us lay aside every weight, correct? The sin which so easily besets us, right? Uh, let us run with endurance. Can you see this? It looks like we've got three sentences here with three main verbs. Technically, it's only one verb. The other two are on the wings. They're not verbs. Let us run is the challenge. So here we have deeply, deep motivation, number one. Secondly, now we have now watch this very, very carefully. We have now deep determination. Let us run. You cannot run without determination. You need the determination. But there is only one main verbal idea here, and it is called let us run. Okay, then how, what do we do with the other two uh, statements? Okay, the other two statements are, we are surrounded. The other statement is, let aside, lay aside every weight. Now, we call these participles. Okay, participles are important, but they are not a main idea. A participle works in conjunction with the running. It's like when you run, you don't just run with your legs, you run with your hands too. You cannot 
put your hands down and run with your legs, you're not going to go very, very far or go very, very fast. You've got to pump everything. So as you run, your hands run together with the legs. Right? They, they go together. Participles function together with verbs. But they are auxiliary. Right? You cannot just simply put away all the sins. Hey, don't run. You can't do that. You cannot lay aside every weight and don't run. You can't do that. The focus is not putting aside. The focus is not laying away. The focus is let us run. Now that is the challenge. There is motivation to run. But there must be determination to run. And the determination to run is expressed in the two participle ideas. The two participle ideas are extra verbs, but they only add value to the running word. Right? So the key word is be motivated to run. But how do you run? I think this is a real great challenge. Many years ago, there was a huge problem uh, over in Africa. There were the Hutus and the Tutsis. And it was a big battle between the two. And one day, one of them decided that they wanted to kill the others. And it was a real massacre. And there was this one man who was there. And his friends were, they were all friends together. And they were in school. Suddenly, the whole school was surrounded. And then they began to kill people with the machetes. And then people died, one after the other. The whole school, almost everyone got slaughtered, murdered. And he was injured. And they poured kerosene and they wanted to burn the whole school with everybody inside. And, you know, he just thought, by a better play, dead. He was injured, but he was not dead. So he went to lie down. And piles and piles of body were on top of him. And they burned the whole school. You know, he could have given up. But he said, a voice came to him and said, don't give up. You're not dead. I'm going to be with you. And I want you to run. Now, he got out of the, out, out of the copses that on top of him, shoved down the window. He was wondering, should I, how can I escape? But he did. And he ran, literally for his life. And he ran to 20 miles away to the nearest hospital. You know, what? all the time in his mind, this whole idea of running became his only focus. I've got to tell people what happened. Therefore, and he determined to run. He was, his back was burned. His legs were burned. He was in great pain. He had no shoes. You know, he just ran for the next 20 miles. But later on, he went over. He was, um, he was uh, rescued. And uh, he, is, he lives in Austin, Texas today. He's a coach to teach people how to run. He always tells this story. I run. One, I'm deeply motivated. Two, I'm deeply determined to help people to understand the meaning of what it means to have faith in God and to run this race of life. That's what we want to do. And I want to be deeply motivated to run this race of mine. And what do I want to do? I want to determine. But my focus is, therefore, let me run. Laying aside, casting away the things that beset me are auxiliaries. They are participles. You know, I need to do the both of them. But my focus is simply, let me run. Lord, let us run together. And I think this is what the challenge is. You know, I am inviting all of us as we begin our 23rd year. This is our race of faith. Rather than a race of life. This is a race that is set for us. Now this is interesting. 
And the word for race is interesting because it's the word where we get the English word agony. Interesting. You know, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, you know, in any sense, uh, well, just a walk in the park. It's not going to be. And it's going to be greatly challenging. But can it be done? And the answer is yes. This morning I was speaking to Mara. And I was asking her whether she had a blood test. And I said, you know, uh, she said, no, a GP saw the blood test. But I said, this blood test is a very specialized one. You've got to go and get a person who's going to get, go and see a rheumatologist and test for the gene and see whether she has an ankylosing spondylitis. A GP won't pick it up. What's well, interesting, so when I, when I went on there and the doctor said, look, I'm going to test this for you, and then I found that I had this, this thing called ankylosing spondylitis, which literally means that a lot of the muscles are just going to jam up together. And it's going to be painful. And so all the symptoms you described sounds just like mine. But you know what? There is treatment. And you want to go for it. And you want to be motivated. And then after it, you want to be determined. You're too young to just simply wait for the bad things to come. Fight it. Be motivated. Fight it. Live. And this is what we all should be challenged to do. We have our own race to run. Let's run this race. We all have different things. Is it possible? And it is wonderful. I I like this idea of let us run. You know, uh, you know there are there are times when you run alone. It's okay if you like to be alone. But you know it helps when you have people who run alongside. It really does. You know, it's a so wonderful thing in terms of how uh, we we can we can be here to help run along. From time to time, I ask myself. Does Pastor Chris still need me? Um, so I asked, should I come along? Should I go and visit with him? And I just came on thinking, I want to run alongside with him for a little while more, you know. And just, that's along the way, share with him things, encourage his heart and lift up his heart. See, this is what we mean, the let us part. We, it's, it's together that we find encouragement. It is together that we find that we can sustain this idea. There are two key words in these two verses. One is therefore. Do I have this faith? Can I say something to you? Don't just run this faith. Let this faith run you. That is the difference. The let us run has an aspect of let's do our part. There is another aspect where faith runs you. This is what is there for. It's there for inside you. What is it that drove Moses? Faith. What is it that drove Abraham? Faith. What is it that drove Samuel and David and others? Faith inside them. This faith was running their lives. And we all need to have something that will run us. Then we can run. So here is a person who runs, but go deeper. And you find that something is causing this person to run. What is it? And you discover that it's in fact faith. You see, we need to do this. So we need to be deeply motivated. We need to be deeply determined. But then here is something else. We need a faith that is so real, that is so deep, it runs us. Then once that faith runs us, we keep on moving all the time. How wonderful it is to begin the year, the new year, with this thought. Let this faith run us. Rather than just simply run this faith of ours. So there is deep motivation, therefore. There is deep determination, let us run with endurance. And then finally, as we pull them all together, we begin to realize it is simply by faith. It is through faith. And when we can do it by faith and through faith, we find that this faith runs us. And the power that runs us is the power of our faith in God. And when we can have this, then we find that we are able to attempt great things for the Lord. Are we tired already after 22 years of service? Hardly. We've just begun. 
Bethany has just celebrated its 43rd anniversary. We're going on to 44th and building a greater team, a more dynamic team to serve the Lord. 44 years later, what's the secret? Same sharing with you. Deep motivation, deep determination. And you know what else we're going to have? It is the deep faith that runs us. And once this faith runs us, then we have no problem whatsoever seeking to do things for the Lord. May the Lord bless our hearts as we ponder these thoughts. Let's prepare our hearts for communion. Before we take time to have communion together, ever since the celebration of our 40th anniversary, I sat in the pew one day as the, the chairman led worship, and this was my prayer to the Lord. I said to the Lord, you know, I have spoken for you I have taught your word, I have preached it, I have written, I ask for if you would give me this gift. Let me try to write poems instead. So from the 40th year, the beginning of the 41st year, I began to write in poetry form. It's been only three years since I began writing poetry. And I have written hundreds since then. At every communion, I would try and do a special poem for communion. And uh, I thought it would be good if we can uh, have another one just for the occasion when Bethany and Bethel combine together. The subject is also taken from the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews 12, um, this is called, uh, from, it's called the Church of the Firstborn. The church is described as the Church of the Firstborn. What does that mean? The original firstborn is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nobody else like him. Firstborn. But it's given to us a special status. The word firstborn is in plural. And what it really means is that as far as God is concerned, we are heirs with Christ, joined heirs with Him, and we are called firstborn in status before the sight of God. So it doesn't matter whether you're Australians or Singaporeans. We should not make the distinction. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're poor. It doesn't matter whether you're students or you're experienced people. It doesn't matter whether you're from Kenya or anywhere else. It really doesn't matter at all. We together form the church of the firstborn. There is a oneness here. So I thought I would write this um, for you and share this with you. And I just sent this to, to Pastor Chris a, a couple of days ago. I want to read this for you before we have communion together. The phrase, the church of the firstborn, is profound and deep. It bears much thinking. The high thoughts contained are steep. The world is badly divided and the rifts threaten to become worse. But in the church of the Lord, no one need to suffer hunger or thirst. In the salvation of the Lord, the Lord gives to us, we are given true equality. There is no slave nor free. There is true and glorious liberty. We are all given the status firstborn in the sight of our God. How grateful we should be for our salvation in Christ the Lord. Together we may partake of the Lord's Supper with true unity. No one needs to feel despised even if one is in abject poverty. 
Together we may join our hearts and hands in the kingdom of God. By faith we will be able to achieve much for the glory of our Lord. The Lord Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren despite our sins. He has given us his very own life and we may be cleansed from deep within. How our hearts must especially rejoice as true brethren in the Lord. Let us share the Lord's Supper, thankful that we are firstborn before God. Well, these are my thoughts I want to share with you. We are truly firstborn in the sight of God. And I was just deeply moved uh, to share that with you. The first phrase, this beautiful poem is Pastor Chris. I didn't write it. Uh, I don't want to describe my own poem. In there. <laughs> this is just his word, okay? So just, just to clarify things. Uh, the rest are mine, but that part of it is his. <laughs> but it is so wonderful to, to come together and, uh, you know, as we partake of bread together. Um, let's turn to a beautiful hymn together in preparation. Then I want to share with you what the secret is in having a faith that is always vibrant and alive. And it is truly is because we are close to the Lord. And so as we partake of the Lord's Supper today, as we, as we sing uh, this hymn, may we draw, be drawn closer to the Lord. And in our drawing closer to the Lord, we will be able to understand and appreciate what it means to have a faith that is real, that is strong, that is vibrant, that is alive. Okay, so we're going to share the bread together. And uh, we're going to partake of this. If you can find a way in which we can avoid this, let me know. Let Pastor Chris know so that we can just take this away. Uh, but otherwise, we'll just have to bear with it. The Lord Jesus Christ reminds us. He said to the disciples, this bread represents his body broken for us. And we are to partake of it in remembrance of him. And as we remember the Lord, as we think of the faith that he has given to us, as we think of what it really means to have this faith, as we deeply motivate it, even as we sing, be drawn close to the Lord, and then begin the 23rd year together like this. Let's sing together 365, all three stanzas. Let us partake of this bread, symbolizing the body of the Lord Jesus Christ broken for us. There's a deep determination and motivation the desire to run this race of faith in our life. And may the faith of the Lord given to us run us. Let's partake of this bread together. Our Father, we thank you for faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord. We now ask for the faith to follow his footsteps, faith that will fill our hearts and our minds and our very soul, faith that makes us come alive to a great and living Savior, moving us, motivating us, enabling us to determine that we're going to make our lives count for you, to your glory. We ask you to refresh us and strengthen us as we poise ourselves to commence our 23rd year of ministry. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ, when he had taken the cup, he took, he blessed it. Then as he partook of it, he gave it to the disciples. And he said, drink all of it. 
And it's so wonderful to be able to see how what the Lord meant. He says, this is the blood of the new covenant. It is shed in remission for our sins. You know, it's just absolutely wonderful to see how the Lord has provided for us. We cannot but see the Lord's love in all these things. The Lord's love in providing for battle, for battle. The Lord's love in raising up the people He has. This is the Lord's love all over the place. You cannot miss it. What's our response? I think that this beautiful hymn helps us to respond effectively. To say to the Lord, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. You know, to be able to tell the Lord that we love him, if ever we love the Lord, let these words be said now. As we commence 23rd year, let's tell the Lord, Lord, I love you. And my faith in you is intact. Come, the next, come this new year, I'm going to be there. I'm going to cultivate this faith, and I'm going to deepen this faith, and I'm going to let this faith run me. I think that would be a wonderful, wonderful challenge. So as we partake of the cup together, let's sing this, 364, all four stanzas, and let's make this our prayer from our hearts as we sing. Our Father, we thank you with deep gratitude in our heart for your grace, your mercy all our life through. You were there in our illnesses. You were there in the forgiveness of our sins. You were there in critical moments. You've always been there, even though we may not sometimes notice you in the background. But we want to thank you for being there always. We want to say how much we love you. Our Father, we pray that you will continue to lead and bless Bethel. We ask you to bless Pastor Chris and the session members as they lead the church. And we ask you to raise up for yourself, for your glory, people who will serve you, that their faith would be strong and vibrant, and they will be in the forefront of your work. We pray that you will galvanize and strengthen our faith as we look forward to serving you in the new 23rd year ahead of us. And Father, as we give the first offering for the 23rd year, we ask you to receive it as a gift from our hearts. We ask you to bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give our first gift for the 23rd year. Pastor Chris will be in Singapore next week. And um, he will be ministering alongside as we hold a pastoral conference for our Indian pastors. Be a challenging time of... Um, evaluating and strengthening the work of the Lord over in India. And we want to challenge all our brethren there to take their lives and to reconsecrate them to the Lord. That's one of the things we hope to challenge them to consider at the pastoral conference next week over in, uh, it's just restricted to the pastors, but it's um, really going to be a challenging week, and we're glad that uh, Pastor Chris will be there alongside the other pastors uh, from Singapore. Well, as we begin the 23rd year, I think it is a good place to begin and say to the Lord, Here, Lord, is my life. Take it and let it be consecrated uh, to thee. But let's sing the first couple of stanzas seated, and then we will sing, I will signal you when to rise. Okay? 379, take my life and let it be. And now may this great and wonderful God, whom we are privileged to call Father, help us to know that he is with us as he has promised and that he will be with us and hear our prayers. May the Lord Jesus Christ, the one we look up to, as the author and finisher of our faith, Enable us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. And may the power of the Spirit of God come upon us, filling our hearts, enabling us to find a vibrant and dynamic faith 
that will empower us to attempt and to achieve great things for the glory of a wonderful Lord and Savior, to whom be glory now and forever. Amen.